Declaring a climate emergency for the first time, scientists used the expression in a study and called for rapid and radical changes to reverse course. We will discuss those findings with one of the authors of the report. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The Oxford Dictionary elected climate emergency as the word of the year. The usage of the expression grew 100 times in the last 12 months, but only just recently was used in a scientific report. The study, signed by more than 11,000 specialists from 153 countries, marks the first time a large group of scientists has formally labelled climate change an emergency. This year, the planet has seen a lot of extreme weather events like the recent flooding in Venice, Italy, or the bushfires in Australia that shrouded Sydney with a thick haze. According to the study, they were caused by human actions that increased greenhouse gas emissions. The scientists also listed six major steps to address the crisis. To discuss this climate emergency, we welcome one of the main co-authors of the report, William Muma. He is an emeritus professor of international environmental policy at Tufts University. He joins us from Boston. With us in our studio, Paul Bledsoe is president of Bledsoe & Associates and served as a climate advisor to U.S. President Bill Clinton. From New York, Amy Davidson is the executive director of the Climate Group, and Bob Ward joins us from London. He is director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Thank you to all of you for joining us. William Moomer, let me start with you. You are one of the co-authors of that report. We've already been warned, of course, of the impact and the effects of climate change, flooding, droughts, uh, rising sea levels, rising temperatures. But this report uses the term climate emergency. What is the new knowledge or the new data that we have now that points to this being a climate emergency? Well, uh, I have uh, actually served on five of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports over the years, which became ever stronger in their concern, in their concern about what's happening uh, with climate change. Uh, but um, it, uh, it seemed to um, uh, Bill Ripple, who was the initiator of this idea, and me and others, that uh, things were really becoming really d very dire. Um, three Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports in the last year, uh, one about the uh, having to reduce our emission, our net emissions by about 45% uh, by 2030, uh, and uh, uh, one about the destruction on land and the other about the melting of ice <coughs> and the uh, rising of the oceans, uh, convinced us that uh, we are beyond um, a gradualist process. Uh, it is, it is uh, we, we are into uh, irreversible changes that are taking place, such as uh, <clears throat> some of the melting of uh, Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, if we don't act uh, very rapidly, uh, we are going to, uh, there, there are going to be a lot more very unpleasant things happening uh, to uh, people all over the world. When you say irreversible, William, uh, is it already too late? Well, I mean, it's too late for some things, but it's not too late for the worst things that can happen. And uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, having, it, having it bad is, uh, is, is a whole lot better than having it uh, literally terrible and in, and, and in some parts of the world impossible. The world is already warmed to the point that there are places like in India where uh, the temperatures are so high that uh, people can only work outdoors uh, for less than an hour. And you know, this, these are the poorer parts of the world that are in the tropics that are suffering the most, but we're clearly having problems here in the United States with the uh, fires in California and the, uh, this past year was the most rainfall intense period in the 48 states in history. And that's disrupted agriculture. It's just having consequences that are not easily dealt with and we're not prepared for. Amy Davidson, of course, everyone's responsible in this fight against climate change. We're aware of that. But you focus on corporate responsibility, on what businesses can do. Uh, how are businesses responding to this crisis? Well, absolutely. Businesses um, understand that this is a, a significant issue to their future and their global operations. So we have been working with businesses on one particular um, piece of work, which is all voluntary, frankly, 
that companies are committing to 100% renewable electricity through a, prog a program called RE100. So they're committing 100% renewable electricity across their global operations. And this is sending a key demand signal to the market that these companies want clean electricity and they don't want to be reliant on coal or natural gas because that's just going to exacerbate the climate emergency. And with that, luckily, costs be are beginning to come down as more and more renewables come into the market. So what we're finding and what the businesses see is that renewables are actually the most cost-effective solutions for them, for them to access electricity. So it's a very, very positive impact. So businesses are excited to lead the clean energy transition, and they recognize that it's a very positive economic benefit for them and for their future. Amy, as you point out, uh, these are voluntary efforts. Are there enough businesses who've signed on to these efforts to fight climate change? Yeah, so we have about 300 companies around the world that are committed to either 100% um, renewable electricity or doubling their energy productivity or advancing electric vehicles in their fleets to go 100% in their fleets. Um, in the U.S., um, that's about 90 companies in total. So it's a, it's a fantastic leadership group with some of the names from Bank of America to 3M. So it's diverse across all sectors. Um, so th they really are able to uh, drive forward the change, um, but we need more. Clearly it's not enough, just right. maybe 90 companies, but these are the leading companies and their brands are well known and people do take notice when they take action. Paul Bledsoe, you've worked on climate change issues uh, for the Bill Clinton uh, White House. The current White House, of course, under President Trump, thinks that climate change is a hoax. Uh, President Trump says simply, I don't believe it. Uh, how much of a setback is that? Well, how much of a challenge is that? Uh, unfortunately, global emissions are rising again. Um, for the period 2014 to 2016, they were relatively flat. But in the last few years, the emissions of the biggest emitters, particularly China and the United States, are rising significantly again. This is at just the time when we need to begin reducing emissions radically, <coughs> as William pointed out. We're headed toward a hot house planet, and I don't think global leaders are grappling with the national security, public safety, and economic consequences of these huge climate change impacts which are about to start. So I think the Trump administration, sadly, is in complete denial about this. Interestingly, I think efforts like these scientists' report and efforts like the youth movement on climate are beginning to change the politics of climate. I actually think his stance is going to hurt him considerably in the 2020 election. Bob Warren, uh, there is a belief in some quarters that fighting climate change comes at a cost, and that cost is economic development. Can one <coughs> fight climate change and have economic development at the same time? Uh, yes, and there are examples all around the world. Um, if you take the United Kingdom, for instance, it has reduced its annual emissions of greenhouse gases by about 44% since 1990, and its economy has expanded by 75%. And there are lots of countries that are showing that you can decouple economic growth from the greenhouse gas emissions. But there are still some leaders, some business leaders, some political leaders who think that it's uh, a choice one or the other. But increasingly, I think people are understanding that the pathway to sustainable growth, where you have growth that really builds prosperity, uh, better health around the world, is one which is sustainable because it doesn't damage the environment and damage people's lives. And that means not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also reducing things like air pollution. So when you are uh, tackling fossil fuels, which is the main <coughs> source of carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas, you're both tackling climate change and often tackling air pollution, which is a huge blight, particularly in uh, many big cities in the emerging market countries. William Muma, the report, of course, paints a very dire picture of what the world could be facing by 2050, but it also prescribes solutions. Uh, given that it's calling climate, uh, the climate uh, change uh, an emergency right now, um, what are the solutions that you are prescribing immediately? By the way, we had a long discussion about what to call it, and we decided that crisis is an overused word and leaves you with nothing to do, whereas a crisis requires uh, a, a response, or rather emergency requires a response. 
And so we, <clears throat> we list uh, six categories of things, and one of them, of course, is to reduce emissions, as, uh, as Amy Davidson and, and others have, have, have commented. Um, and that needs to be done really rapidly. But at the same time, we need to increase the removal rate of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. People are unaware of the fact that we put about 11 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year as the world, and uh, only less than five appear in the atmosphere. And that's because natural systems, forests, wetlands, grasslands, and the oceans are absorbing more than half of what we put in every year. Yet our land is being degraded all the time to absorb less. And in fact, forests and grasslands could be absorbing twice as much as they are right now. So they could be absorbing not 25% of, of, um, of carbon dioxide, but 50%. Uh, and it means that we would have to rethink how we how we manage these, these areas and how we protect them. And um, the existing forests we have are the ones that will grow the most in the next 10 and 50 years. Um, and, um, and, and that's far better than, than planting new forests. I mean, we should plant new forests, but they won't store very much until probably 50 or 75 years from now. Whereas existing forests are absorbing it right now, and if allowed to continue growing, will absorb much more. Bob Ward, to the points that uh, William uh, Mumama makes there, uh, we are also seeing forests being degraded in places like Brazil, in Indonesia. Uh, and what about uh, the role that the ocean could play in uh, storing uh, carbon? Yes, the ocean also is absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but we do know that that isn't an endless capacity. And as you warm the oceans, <coughs> the chances are that you're reducing the capacity of the oceans to absorb further carbon dioxide. And when it starts not absorbing as much as it does at the moment, you will see a more uh, rapid buildup in the atmosphere. The other thing to note about the absorption of carbon dioxide in the oceans is that there's a chemical reaction with the ocean water which creates a more acidic water. And that acidification of ocean water is damaging much of the wildlife in the oceans, particularly those organisms that rely on using calcium carbonate mm -hmm. in order to, fill, to produce shells. And with the more acidic ocean water, they find it more difficult. So it's not just the warming of the oceans that's the problem there, it's the acidification as well. Go ahead. Uh, Anand, I was just going to say that all of this points to the need to limit near-term temperatures. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, the major reports like the IPCC yeah. are finding that we have to avoid near-term temperature increases or we may set off self-reinforcing feedback loops in the natural system that bring on even more warming, even if we don't emit a lot more. So we need to do several things to reduce near-term temperatures. We absolutely when you say near term. What does that mean? The next 20, the 10 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is not just cut CO2, half of which stays in the atmosphere a uh, hundred yeah. years. We need to also probably remove carbon from the atmosphere. There, there's uh, the IPCC has recommended that we consider direct air capture. Mm -hmm. machines that actually remove carbon directly from the atmosphere. We also need to recognize that 35% of warming is not CO2. It's so-called short-lived forces like hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon, right. tropospheric ozone. And we need to reduce these emissions very quickly. If we cut those, we can re avoid warming in the next decade or two and prevent some of these feedback loops. It's worth noting we've already done some of that. The Kigali Agreement to the Montreal Protocol mm -hmm. will eliminate HFCs, a very powerful right. super pollutant, uh, in the next 20 years. That will avoid a half a degree Celsius of warming in this century. So there are actions we can take to reduce near-term temperatures to avoid some of these catastrophes. All right. Amy Davidson, getting back to the role of corporations and companies, uh, of course, it's not a short-term thing here, but are companies building into their long-term strategic plans the need to fight climate change? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the companies that are leading are looking at this as a core part of their strategy. Um, they're building teams that are able to, you know, uh, look at the risks as well as the opportunities, because there's a whole opportunity angle here about 
the economy gets better and businesses are only going to get better if we can address climate change. So the companies are building teams both from the you know, management level but right up into the C-suite. Most leading companies have um, a person dedicated to be looking at these risks and opportunities and how to reduce emissions you know, across the board even through their supply chain as well as up to the board governance level. I mean, that becomes a key component, is that board level oversight over these risks. It's that serious, it's that much of an emergency, and mm -hmm. again, the leading companies are looking at it in that way strategically, because if, they don't, if there isn't a healthy environment in the future, you're not gonna have a healthy company or healthy economy. Right, Amy, you know, very often we look at this as a top-down solution, but in this particular instance, can businesses actually influence the way government thinks? Absolutely. I mean, they can do it in a couple ways. Again, as I mentioned, you know, they're, they're sending a signal to the market um, and they're sort of creating these proof points to policymakers that, uh, you know, addressing climate change actually has a positive economic um, impact for them. And that's really important for policymakers to, to know. I mean, there's a lot of divisiveness in this country at the moment and a lot of misinformation. Obviously, we hear a lot about it around climate science, but it's also about the economic benefits of taking action. So companies play a role um, in you know, just sort of showing those proof points, but they also can lift their voices a lot louder, frankly. And recently, we um, had called on, we and like a, a 10 other NGOs called on the CEOs of corporate America to set a science-based climate policy agenda, so really align their advocacy towards the net zero emissions uh, future that we need by 2050. Right. Increasingly, uh, uh, financial institutions, investors and so forth, are discovering climate risk in their investments. Either it will be regulatory risk or it will be disaster risk. And uh, so uh, already we're beginning to see a shift in where uh, uh, investors are placing their money uh, based on climate risk and I work with a, a, a science organization that's working with the financial industry directly to uh, help them evaluate uh, climate risk. Bob Ward, looking at the picture in Europe, the European Union just uh, reached a deal to use 21% of its 2020 budget to fight climate change. How will the money be used and what kind of impact will that have in Europe? Well, in Europe, uh, there's an understanding that uh, you can use investments to drive a transition towards a zero carbon economy. So it's, it's actually a positive boost for the economy. And if you think about the ways in which you can invest it, for instance, you can invest in cleaner forms of electricity production. Instead of generating <laughs> electricity through gas and coal and oil, that you look for cleaner alternatives. Those cleaner alternatives, in, in many cases now, the uh, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy for generating electricity. And that's the experience in many parts of Europe, but also in North America, in Asia. And so by using cheaper forms of energy generation, you're actually providing a boost to the economy. But there's also investments in the de rapid development of alternatives to petrol and, or sorry, gasoline and diesel driven vehicles and the move towards electric vehicles which will have lots of benefits again in cities because you will reduce air pollution and you will have a more, hopefully a more efficient transport system, investments in public transport. All of these things not only tackle climate change but they have other positive economic benefits so it's good for growth and good for the climate. Anand, Bob and Amy are exactly right. In fact, there is strong reason to believe that uh, many of the fossil fuel assets that oil companies and others hold today will never get used. Mm -hmm. uh, they will either be taxed so highly or banned altogether. This is called so-called stranded assets or the carbon bubble. And there's reason to believe that this is a risk for financial markets, that the valuations of fossil fuel companies are wildly overstated in, in terms of the long run. There are recent studies that show that no more fossil fuels can be uh, developed and uh, counted as reserves if we're going to meet, for example, the Paris Agreement reduction of uh, limiting of temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius. William Moore, I was wondering about the, the flow of information here in the United States because we've heard President Trump tell us more than once that efforts to fight climate change would undermine the United States economy. But there was a study done by the Economist Intelligence Unit which said that uh, 
global growth could actually fall by 3% over the next 30 years if nothing is done about climate change. Of course, there's also enormous investment challenges in this new green technology. Why isn't that message being heard here? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, we, we, are, we are literally in the world now spending hundreds of billions of dollars uh, addressing damages. Um, it, it will soon be over a trillion dollars a year on a regular basis and growing from there. And uh, uh, unfortunately, so, some, of the, some of those costs will add to the, GD, to the GDP. So a 3% decrease doesn't sound like much, but in terms of the functional GDP, it's a much greater decrease uh, than that. And I think the problem is that um, uh, the, the, um, the companies, um, there are many companies that would rather defend the status quo than to innovate. And so uh, this is why uh, the coal industry, for example, you know, a 19th century fuel for a 20th century technology uh, is, is still trying to hold on, and yet it's collapsing in the United States as an industry despite the president's best efforts to prop it up. The calls for direct air capture, think about this, we have none of it now. How much of it can we do in the next 10 years? And the answer is not much. How much can natural systems do in the next 10 years they could, they could be removing another 5 to 10 percent than they're producing, r removing right now. So it, it, we really should put much more emphasis on natural systems. And that and the removal of the short-term uh, pollutants, which uh, is also one of our recommendations, uh, would go a long way uh, towards helping us um, meet the goal of uh, reduce, dramatically reducing our, our net emissions as we simultaneously reduce the use of fossil fuels. Amy, we talk about uh, the role that business can play, but what about consumers? I mean, that's a powerful group of people there. Yeah, I mean, similar to the way businesses send a demand signal, consumers have that same ability through their, the way they vote with their pocketbook. Um, so absolutely, I mean, we see that businesses listen. Um, consumers can make that choice to buy the energy efficient LED light bulb versus an incandescent or buy an electric vehicle or fuel efficient car rather than a gas guzzler. And all of those market signals are heard, certainly by businesses, so consumers have a significant voice. Bob Ward, we've just yeah. seen these very dramatic pictures coming yeah. out of Italy from Venice where there's been serious flooding. We also saw the pictures of devastating bushfires in Australia. Are we going to see a lot more of that? Yeah, well, we clearly see, are seeing that all around the world. In Venice, um, it often floods at this time of year because of um, a combination of um, high tides and strong winds that blow along the Adriatic northwards, which tends to force seawater in and <coughs> raise sea levels in Venice. But the flooding is getting worse in Venice year on year because the sea level is rising around the world because of the warming of the oceans and of the melting of the glaciers and ice caps. So it's clear that climate change is making it worse. If you look in Australia, despite the denials of the Australian Prime Minister, the scientists are clear the hotter, drier weather that we are increasingly seeing in places like Australia and in California is creating more likely conditions for wildfires to spread. So we are seeing these impacts all over the planet and you have to be willfully blind not to see what is happening because frankly people are seeing it in their day-to-day -day lives. It's not just in terms of disasters, farmers and gardeners around the world are seeing that the seasons are changing because it's gradually getting warmer. So it's increasingly becoming difficult for those political leaders like Donald Trump mm -hmm. who are prepared to turn a blind eye to the science because everybody else can see what's happening. The cost of extreme weather events in the United States in 2017 alone were $130 billion that yeah. the U.S. government had to put through to emergencies. That's a quarter of the non-discretionary budget of the right. entire United States. These are huge economic impacts and, and the president's in complete denial about it. And I think there's a very good chance <laughs> yeah. it may be one of the things that costs him re-election. Amy, talking about efforts to get the message through, there's some novel efforts that we see. We see the, uh, the band, the British band Coldplay has released a new album, but it won't be doing any concerts because it wants to do its bit for uh, the fight against climate change. Another big group, Radiohead, uh, will change the type of lights that it uses in concerts. And I'm wondering what kind of impact will these efforts have, especially on young people? 
Well, I mean, each of those bands are, you know, have quite a huge following, and I think that matters. You know, uh, young people, as well as all of us, we look up to those influencers to see what are they doing, and they sort of set the, the stage. They set, you know, the way we should be going forward. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a very, very positive step. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge Radiohead fan, so I'm delighted that they are being more active. It's important for people not to get the mixed message. And again, in the U.S., we have a lot of mixed messages coming here, um, intentionally misinformation coming from Washington and the administration. So the more, pe more voices that are lifted up that reach um, more people around the country that you know, that obviously that climate change is an emergency and we need to take action, then the better. Can I urge some caution here? If the message we're sending to people around the world is that tackling climate change means a life of deprivation and hardships, not doing the things that we all want to do, we will not persuade people to make the changes fast enough. And so we need to be creating better alternatives for traveling. You need to not tell people they can't travel. You've got to show them that there are other ways of traveling other than relying on fossil fuels. That's a very important aspect of this. Great point. Uh, no, I, I, I live, I, absolutely. I, 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 yes, yeah. we all agree at that, I think. I live in a, a solar-powered, net-zero energy home that is more comfortable than any house I've ever lived in. Right. And I drive an electric vehicle, which is vastly superior to 19th century internal right. combustion engines. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, your life is better, not worse. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat.